This is The Professor's Corner, a McGuire Woods series exploring business and legal issues prevalent in today's private equity industry. Tune in with McGuire Woods partner, Jeff Cockrell, as he and specialists share real-world insight to help enhance your knowledge. Thank you for joining another episode of our Corner Series, where we bring together thought leaders and deal makers in the healthcare private equity investing universe. Uh, and talk through issues that relate to those sorts of transactions. I am thrilled to be joined by my good friend and partner, Tim Fry, uh, who's truly one of the sharpest legal minds I've encountered in my career. Uh, and he helps us navigate a lot of some of the thornier issues uh, in healthcare investing. Uh, but Tim, maybe introduce yourself uh, and your practice, and then we'll jump into some questions. Jeff, thank you for your kind introduction. Again, Tim Fry, I'm actually a former CMS staffer before law school at Northwestern and then joining McGuire Woods now nearly a decade ago. And from that background, um, I definitely come at it from a healthcare regulatory, healthcare policy perspective. And I've been honored to work with so many uh, clients of yours, Jeff, and others at the firm that are investing in healthcare private equity and, and being able to kind of lend that insight, how a policymaker may think about things, how do we address the rules coming out of Washington in such a way to accomplish transactions. And it, I spend all my time in kind of that healthcare regulatory space. And it, it's, uh, it, it keeps me busy, but it also is a lot of fun and enjoyable to kind of work with such wonderful people, so smart at what they do in, in investing and, and kind of lend uh, our abilities as well. So, Tim, you see probably more transactions than anyone, given that you're connecting for, for parts of them. And you have a pretty good bird's eye view of the areas where people can really get in trouble. And one of the dynamics with uh, healthcare regulatory concerns is someone can make a small mistake that accumulates up to a big potential exposure, but what would you say are one or two of the areas where people, you find them getting kind of tripped up on their uh, regulatory compliance? Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And, and you're right. I spend a lot of time supporting our teams in, in kind of um, small issues that come up and, and, and often in, in compensation of physicians. And, and that's one where maybe it's worth starting uh, to answer your question. The physician compensation ends up implicating the federal physician self-referral law. It's commonly known as the Stark Law, named after the author of that law. And it's this strict liability statute which intended to get rid of a physician's incentive to refer 10 categories of what, what it calls designated health services, things like imaging, x-ray, clinical lab services, physical therapy, a few others, places where physicians can kind of make money without doing the work. It started as a simple concept, but it became very complex. And in, in kind of the physician practice space, that means it governs kind of the nitty gritty of how every dollar is allocated within a practice. And it's very easy to make footfalls such that in a fair number of our buy-side deals, Jeff, um, we end up spending time talking about these compensation issues in the Stark Law. And I'm, the way the Stark Law wants ancillary revenue to be split is in a manner that doesn't impact who referred the business. So if you have a practice, a target, and it's 10 orthopedists, they're going to have a lot of imaging, x-ray, DME revenue. What in a pure vanilla circumstance, the Stark Law would bless is for those 10 physicians to take that profit and just split it in tens. That isn't always seen as the fairest approach. You know, different people contribute differently to practices. Some work harder, see more patients, maybe founded the practice, maybe help coach people. And so groups come up with all kinds of ways to split that revenue. And at the end of the day, it's okay to deviate from that equal split, but it has to avoid 
effectively rewarding the person who made the referral. And so things like having, if you have a group of 10, you either need to share it across the 10 or you could split into two groups of five. But if you instead split based on locations and you have three locations such that you no longer have groups of five splitting that revenue, the Stark Law steps in and says it's a violation. So it's really easy to do these footfalls, and, 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 and unfortunately, it's usually not discovered if a group hasn't worked with counsel until a transaction, and that's where on buy side we often see it. And so on the buy side context, when you encounter this, let's stay with your example of orthopedic uh, practice, uh, and, and let's say they were doing it by location, so groups of less than five, which is going to be problematic. What's the order of magnitude of that problem? So the challenge becomes, and this is why it, it pushes us to certain decisions. And in, in, in a transaction, um, you know, Jeff, you'll often ask me, can we just <laughs> rely on indemnity? And, and this is one where we often cannot. And that's because the Stark Law triggers potentially false claims act exposure. And, and for those listening that, you know, maybe haven't ex come across the false claims act in their day to day, the threat is three times what you received from Medicare plus a per claim fine that can be in excess of $20,000. And so what we often see, let's, let's take this orthopedics group, if, if it's in violation and they may have thousands of lab claims for less than $100 each, they could be facing False Claims Act exposure that can quickly add up into the seven, eight, nine figures. And so kind of just relying on indemnity, just relying on, hey, maybe we never get investigated, tends to be something that's very hard to stomach with that headline exposure. And so we often end up kind of looking at things like self-disclosing the conduct to the federal government instead, because these stark issues tend to be settled for a very small amount. Um, we say cents on the dollar and not on the exposure I just suggested, but instead cents on the dollar of the actual amount received from Medicare. And so when you kind of put those next to each other, a lot of people make the choice to say, this is one that's worth self-disclosing and we can put it behind ourselves. Right. The sellers are often frustrated with that answer. They see this as, even if it's a theoretically high magnitude problem, they view it as a low probability of that liability ever coming home. And I always tell people that high magnitude, low probability problems are some of the more difficult ones to resolve. An indemnity and an escrow, especially if you're trying to use an escrow, it's not a conducive remedy because are you gonna uh, escrow this massive amount that is your theoretical liability? Are you gonna hold it maybe forever? It just becomes a, a difficult solution. From a buyer's perspective, uh, we always have an eye both on kind of controlling that risk for ourselves and also with an eye towards, especially in the private equity universe, um, everything that we buy, at some point, we're going to look to sell, and the next buyer is going to have something to say about this as well. And if we don't close off that uh, exposure at the front end, we'll probably be getting pushed to close off that exposure on the back end when it's in our hands. Uh, and so re resolving that uh, on, the, on the front end is a significant benefit. And then one other note that uh, you, uh, uh, that we often see is that if you uh, go through the process of that self-disclosure, you can avoid get kind of whistleblower suits. Uh, you get you get some resolution from that. So you can avoid uh, whistleblower suits, which can be super time-consuming and can go on for a long period of time where you're kind of dead in the water while a uh, government investigation is going on. There's a lot of reasons to really think about kind of fronting the issue, even though it's painful in the context of a deal. Jeff, I thought that was very well said, and your point in the private equity context of the exit or the recap transaction is, is very foremost in our mind. It is now 
maybe wasn't five to 10 years ago, but today it is very much a market position of many of these transactions as they trade for a self-disclosure to take place. And so as a buyer, if you don't kind of cut it off at the time you do your transaction, it is very likely you're going to get pushed into it and you have to bear that expense then um, during that recap opportunity. So we've talked a little bit about issues that can arise based on how the physicians are sharing ancillary service revenue. What are some other kind of hotspots that come up pretty regularly on transactions? Well, not a surprise in the healthcare space when you're talking about money, billing issues you know, come up often. Now, we're often not um, the ones that discover it. As you know, Jeff, Uh, our clients will hire a billing and coding auditor and discover that the practice was billing for nurse practitioners at the same rate that they were billing physicians and not having the appropriate Um, processes in place in order to do that. Under Medicare, that's known as incident to billing. Or they'll discover that um, a practice pattern is to bill a evaluation and management service on the same day as a surgical service in violation of some of the surgery rules. Um, There's all kinds of very nuanced billing rules that the billing and coding companies will discover And that's a situation, Jeff, where things like indemnity or smaller repayments and not a full self-disclosure can be utilized, or you can have discussions around risk and materiality with a lot more um, ability and flexibility in the deals. But when the billing and coding auditors find problems, I'm often spending a lot of time trying to find out is this one that's an automatic um, repayment, so to speak, and that it's just so wrong for Medicare rules? Or are there colorable arguments um, that that are kind of industry norms that we can kind of uh, use things like indemnity or discussions or change patterns in the future while accepting the historic risk? Right. And we spend a lot of time kind of differentiating between shades of gray recognizing that the problem can still arise later on. Uh, but if, like you said, if you can avoid a conclusion that there's a point-blank violation that requires a point-blank reimbursement to the government, you've got some flexibility in how you approach it. Other steps along the way in that is to figure out kind of the order of magnitude of the problem, because if you've isolated uh, some issues in say, the the chart review, you need to figure out, okay, if they were doing this on a wider scale than what these few charts show, what kind of uh, potential reimbursement number would we be talking about? So if you can put a fence around the the topic uh, of uh, magnitude, then you can take those two components of magnitude and probability or the degree of gray that you're looking at and start to frame yourself into a solution that might still enable you to get the deal done. I think that's well stated, Jeff. And, and quite honestly, you know, the, that kind of thought pattern is also very much the case for things like anti-kickback statute concerns or uh, beneficiary inducement concerns at the federal level or state equivalents, where the anti-kickback statute is a criminal law barring referral incentives. But there is often an ability to ring fence it in a more typical corporate way than the Stark Law and physician compensation issues that we talked about before, not because the penalties can't be so large, but the ability to look at shades of gray, help sellers come up with the the stated rationale for why they entered into things, even if it's something that leaves some risk, it often can be addressed in a more typical M&A risk-sharing context than, you know, some of the things we started with. I think we'll leave it there for uh, this episode. Uh, Tim, uh, thanks for joining me, and uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. It's a ton of fun. I'll look forward to it, Jeff, and and thank you to all your listeners uh, for spending some time with us today. Thank you for joining us on this installment of The Professor's Corner. 
To learn more about today's discussion, please email host Jeff Cockrell at gcockrell at mcguirewoods.com. We look forward to hearing from you. This series was recorded and is being made available by McGuire Woods for informational purposes only. By accessing this series, you acknowledge that McGuire Woods makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this installment. The views, information, or opinions expressed are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily reflect those of McGuire Woods. This series should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state and should not be construed as an offer to make or consider any investment or course of action.